I know I've done a pretty poor job of printing lately, so in the 2020 practice test, all right, that I gave you all, I, for some reason it didn't print the last few pages, so I've included them in this handout today, and we're gonna go through them today, okay? So we're gonna go through the graphing problem and question seven. I've also got two questions from last year's exam that are gonna help us emphasize some of 3A tangents and some of 3D2. So we're gonna start this lesson by going through these four questions together, and, uh, and then we'll have the rest of the lesson dedicated to your own revision time. So we're going to start with, we've got two question sevens. We're going to start with the one that has the triangles on it, okay? The one about Easy NRG, which will be a good company name. All right, so let's read it. We've got Easy Energy are looking to minimise the length of power lines they need to install in order for House A and House B to have power. House A is 30 metres from the road and house B is 20 metres from the road and they are a horizontal distance of 100 metres apart. Point D is going to be a junction box. Easy Energy have planned to place a junction box at point D and run power lines over the lengths of DA and DB. Okay, so you can understand. Here's the road, they're 100 metres apart um, horizontally. House A is 30 metres inland, House B is 20 metres inland from the road. And we're going to put a junction box here so that we can connect both of them. And we want to minimise, Seb, this length of power line. Okay, we want to minimise AD plus DB. So firstly, part A, show that the length of power line is given by this equation. Well, the length of power line that we need is equal to the length of AD plus the length of DB. That's what the length of power line that we need is. And now let's focus on just this part of the triangle, ADC. And what we can see there is AD, we can see a pi factor relationship. That 30 squared plus X squared equals AD squared. Okay, so that means that the length AD is the square root of 30 squared plus x squared. Okay, so we've got the first part. I'll tell you, do you have one? No. Oh. Sorry. Does anyone else not have one? Okay, we've got the first part, we've got that part. Now we need to find DB. So again, let's look at this triangle here, and we've got one of the sides but we don't know what this one is or this one is. We can actually come up with an expression for this side in terms of x. We know if CE is 100 and CD is x, then DE is going to be 100 take away x. It's the difference between them. Okay, 100 take x. So then if we're looking at this triangle, okay, again we can think of that Pythagorean relationship, which is um, 20 squared plus 100 take x squared. is equal to db squared, so therefore db is the square root of that. <coughs> Alright, so we've got ad, we've got db, now we're ready to state the length of the equation. Therefore l is 30 squared plus x squared. Part B, state an appropriate domain for L of X. Now there's a temptation here to graph L and try and figure out well, what's an appropriate domain for If we're looking at the graph, there doesn't appear to be any restrictions on it. So we shouldn't think about it with regards to the problem. X is this number here, okay? And so what are the possible values that X could take? Well, X could be zero. And that would be the circumstance where the junction box is right out the front of house A and then the power line passes all the way to point B. So X could be zero. It wouldn't make sense to have the junction box here. Would it? it wouldn't make sense to have a negative value of X. Okay? X could be all the way at point E. All right, so if we disregard that one, X could be all the way at point E. All right, because we 
the x is 100, that length is 100, and so the power line runs all the way from A to out the front of uh, B, that's where the junction box is. Um, so x could be 100, and that's sort of the highest value. It doesn't make sense for it to be further than that either. It has to be somewhere in that region. So therefore, an appropriate domain for x, 0 to 100. Could we be including those values? That would put it right out the front of those respective locations, but doesn't make sense for it to be outside of there. Okay, part C, find the derivative, or sh here we are, show that the derivative is this. So I'm just going to put our equation in a form suitable for differentiating. So firstly, it's 30 plus x squared to the power of half plus 20 squared plus the power of a half. That's 30 squared. Okay, so if we want to find L dash, we're going to use the chain rule. Alright, we have a function to the power of n. So when we differentiate, it becomes n f of x to the n take 1 multiplied by f dash, multiplied by the derivative of the inside here, which is 2x. 30 is a number that depends. Can the change of students? Okay, so that's the first part. And then for the second part, we got another function to the power of n. So we do have to use the chain rule again. We're going to have n f of x to the n take 1. And then we, we need to multiply it by the derivative. Okay, well, when we differentiate what's inside, this part goes to 0. But if we're looking at this part, we actually have to use the chain rule again to differentiate that part. So here we have a constant of a constant. So that's a little bit tricky. But just break it down into its respective segments. If you're just looking at that function to the power of n, what does it become? I'm running out of room for that part there. n f of x, n take 1, times n dash. Okay, so just think about it in terms of its respective parts, all right? If you want a bit of hand unpacking that in a moment, put a mark there, let me know. Let's simplify now. Let's show that it's what they've given us here. Firstly, two and a half, they're going to cancel. Two times a half, that will cancel. We're going to have x at the top. And at the bottom, we have the square root because it's a negative power. Square root of 30 squared plus x squared. Okay. Um, same here, we have half and two, they're multiplying, they can cancel. This, it's going to make the whole thing negative, that's what that negative is going to do, so I'm going to put a minus there. At the top, we're going to have 100 take x, and at the bottom, we're going to have the square root because of the negative power again. Okay, now, uh, important, important, don't forget to put brackets at the top here. Uh, people have done that kind of thing in the past and they forget that that negative needs to apply to both terms. Whereas if you put in brackets there, you're not going to make that mistake. Okay, so that's what it's asking us to show anyway. All right, so then the next two parts are right next to it. Part D, draw a sine diagram of L dash of X. So we're just getting one mark here for drawing the sine diagram and then one mark for stating what the more solution. So for the sine diagram, we want the sine diagram for L dash. We're not considering negative values of x, and even then we're constraining x between 0 and 100. Um, I can look at the original function to draw the sine diagram. Right, I'm going to do that because I've graphed it and it's just going to save time. What I can see from the original function is it's decreasing until it gets to the minimum point, and then it's increasing. Okay, and it reaches its minimum point at 60. So it's decreasing and then increasing. That means the derivative function is negative until it gets to 60 and then positive. Okay, so I can get that from the original function. But let me show you how we can get that from the derivative function. Okay, because if we want to graph this, if we want to draw, excuse me, if we want to draw the sine diagram of the derivative function. Alright, just unselect this one. Just change my view window. Uh, 
So there's the derivative. You can see it crosses over here. I want the root. So if I press G solve the root, remember this is the graph of the derivative function. Uh, that's at zero. So it's thinking about it. I got the old, old model. It's going to bring up 60. X is 60. And we can see it goes from below to above. So this is the sign diagram of the graph of the derivative function. Okay, there it is. And then um, it says, hence state the optimal solution. So I'm going to go back to my function here. And crank my beam window back out. Okay, hence state the optimal solution. Well, let's think about what this is a graph of. Um, on the x axis, I have the possible values of x. And on the y axis, what have I graphed? The length function. That means my y value is going to be the length. So when x is 60 metres, when this length is 60, the length of power lines is 111.8. So the optimal solution, hence determine the length of power line required to connect both cat houses. Well, the length when x is 60. The optimal solution occurs when x is 60, and that is 111, 112 metres of power line. Okay, so no algebra required with the later parts there, it's just using your calculator to support you. Splendid. Okay, let's move on. What we'll go to now is, we'll go to the other question seven. Exploring uh, some of the concepts we touched on in chapter two. Obviously, it's rules of calculus, here's application of calculus, but I do want to stress differentiating and exponential. Okay, so let's start. Points um, here. You've got the graph. Here's their points. Here's the coordinates. Chords. Chords can be drawn from P to Q1, Q2, or Q3. So a chord is just a line that connects two points. All right. So if I was going to draw a chord from P to Q3, it's going to be that line. Identify which of the following chords has a slope which would provide the best approximation for the slope of the tangent to the graph of y equals f of x at P. Okay, so the slope at P, okay, we want to know the slope at P. Which chord is going to be the best indicator of that? Is it going to be P to Q3? Is it going to be P to Q3? Or P to Q1. Let's think about it. Here's the slope of chord P, um, P to Q3. Here's the slope of the chord P to Q2. Here's the slope of the chord P to Q1. And here is the slope at P. Which one is the best approximation? Which one's going to be closest to it? And the answer is P Q1. Alright, that's going to be the closest. You see there it's, it's two negative and there it's the slope at P. So we're going to tick the first box. All right, part two, calculate the slope of the chord. So this means calculate the slope of P, Q, 1. All right, so even if you tick the wrong box there, you can still get the marks here for calculating the slope of the chord that you selected. So, um, so we've got the coordinates of P. We're told then in the paragraph right below the graph that is minus 2 and 7.5, and Q, 1, is 0 to 7. So if we want to know the slope, well the slope is y2 take y1, 1 x2 take x1, 7.5 take 7, on to minus 2 equals 0, minus a quarter. 
Okay, part B. Show that f of x can be expressed as, and we've got this function here. So there's two ways we could do it. We could start with what we've got and manipulate it so we get what they want us to show, or we can start with what they've got. Let's, let's do the latter. We'll start with what they have. A to take E to the 0 0.5 ln 2 of x. So what we have here is we have 0 0.5 times ln 2 times x. Now remember, order of multiplication does not matter. That 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. That means we can rearrange the order here. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to write this as um, e to the ln 2, and then I'm going to put 0.5 times x outside. Okay, so we can do that pretty easily. And then e to the ln 2 is just 2. e to the ln x is x, so e to the ln 2 is 2, and then we're left with that power there, 0.5x, which is f of x. Okay, that's the function we started with. So we have two ways of presenting it. Here or here. Okay, excellent. Any questions about that? Right. Hence show that the derivative is this. So we've got f of x and we need to differentiate it. Now we when we, we saw in chapter two, when we want to differentiate an exponential, we have to express it like that. That's what we saw. So this is going to be the function we differentiate. I'm going to write it up over here f of x is 8 take e to the 0 0.5 ln 2 uh, times x. Now it looks tricky. It looks tricky, but they're just trying to confuse you because 0.5 ln 2 is just a number. All right? you, you can calculate it to a few significant figures if you want, but let's leave it like that. Okay, so what that means is we have here e to the kx. That's the function. It's e to the sum number k times x, and the derivative of e to the kx is a e to the kx. So now when we differentiate this, it's going to become the well, derivative of 8, and it disappears, magic. Um, the negative is going to hang out, and so then we're looking at e to the kx becomes k e to the kx. 0.5 ln 2 e to the 0.5 ln 2 of x. So that's the derivative, but it does give us a show that and wants us to show that it simplifies. Well, we know e to the 0.5 ln 2 simplifies to 2 to the 0.5. Okay, that's what we show over here, that e to the 0.5 ln 2. That part there explicitly simplifies to 2 to the 0.5, and that's what it's asking us to show. That's our slope function. Any questions so far? Okay, even if you haven't got those two parts, you can still get this last part because they've given you all the information you need. Using an algebraic process, find the exact equation of the tangent. So this is good. We have an opportunity to revise 3a and we have an opportunity to utilise some of our skills with exponentials and logarithms. So, tangent. If we want a tangent, we need two things. We need the point of contact and we need the slope. Okay, now the point of contact is the coordinates of point P. They are given to us. The coordinates of point P is x is minus 2, y is 7.5. The slope. The slope is not what we calculated in part 2. That's the slope of the chord. That's an approximation of the slope. We want the exact slope, which is why we've found the derivative. The derivative function tells us the slope for any value of x. So we're going to use the derivative to find the slope when x is minus 2. That's the coordinates of point P. Nick, you're up. Yep. Oh. So that means our slope is going to be minus 0 0.5 ln 2 uh, times 2 power of 0 0.5 times minus 2. We want the slope at minus 2. Okay, now I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. Now 2 um, half times minus 2 is to minus 1. And 
2 to the minus 1 is just a half, isn't it? We can take it to the bottom, and then if we have a half times a half, that's a quarter. So we've got minus a quarter L and 2. Now that's, that's what it simplifies to. Um, nonetheless, you can still go on and solve it using this. It just looks a little bit more complicated. All right, so I've simplified it down to that. We have everything we need to find the tangent. Let's not forget, what are we doing here? We're finding the equation of the tangent. That is y equals mx plus c. m is the slope. We've got the slope. So we're going to start with y equals minus a quarter ln 2. That's m. x plus c. And we're talking about the slope when x is 2, minus 2, y is 7.5. So we'll substitute that in. And we're just solving for c. of C, and then we need to make the statement, what is the equation of the tangent? Well, it's y equals m, x plus, here's our value of C, in exact form, okay, it includes every possible decimal place. So, here's our slope. This is our y-intercept expressed exactly. Okay? Cool. All right. So now let's move on to question six. So this is how bad a job I did printing it. Well, it's because I tried to print it as a booklet, but I didn't press it for free. So. so that's the first part of question six. And then that's the second part of question six. Okay? And that's the first part of question two, and that's the second part of question two. So we're going to be going on that page and that page. That's what we're going to be addressing. All right, so let me sketch the graph up here so I can refer to it. We've got, it sort of goes like this. <laughs> State points on f of x such that f dash of x is less than zero. Okay? What point on this graph corresponds with f dash of x being less than zero? What does f dash of x being less than zero mean? It means the slope is negative. f dash of x is the slope function. When is the slope negative? Okay, we can see, oh, it's negative at point A. You'd be walking down the hill, and then nowhere else is it negative. Okay, so when is the slope negative? Point A. That's our one. One mark. Okay, what about when is the slope zero? Okay, when is the slope, uh, sorry, when is f dash dash x zero? Well, that occurs at points of inflection. So let's look at the function and go, where are the points of inflection? Where do they occur? I can see concave up, and here it changes from being concave up to concave down. And here, changes from being concave down to concave up. Alright, so with our points of inflection, the second derivative is going to equal zero at points C and B. Now, I might point out there as well, notice how for this part you get one mark, and whereas for this part there's two marks. Okay? So that can be a tell. That can tell you, I've got to write down two things here. We're getting one mark for writing down each thing. So you know, don't just write one of them. So look out for mark allocation because it can inform you to the degree uh, uh, of yeah, what's involved in the question. Okay, so then we're on to part C where it says draw a graph of the first derivative. All right. So this is going back to 3D.2. Okay. 
okay? And this is one thing we've done pretty well. I think we'll all be okay with this. What we need to do is we start with the sine diagram of the derivative function. Looking at the original function, we can see it is decreasing until we get to B, which means the slope is negative until we get to point B. Then we have positive slope, okay, we're walking up the hill. Until we get to D, where we have that stationary point of inflection, don't we? So the slope is zero at that point, but then it keeps increasing. Okay, so we have negative, positive, positive. All right, so we can sketch this right, okay? Uh, but then there's one other thing that we do need to consider. So I'm just gonna sketch what I've got here. It's negative until we get to B, and then it's positive, and it's positive, and it touches at D, and then it stays positive. Okay, so that's B, and that's D. All right, so that's good. Okay, but there's one more thing that we need to check or maybe make note of. So you get the three marks there, I think you've got two. All right, uh, and that is that points of inflection on f of x correspond with turning points on f dash. So that's our turning point, that's one of them, E. But the other turning point is the other point of inflection, which is C. So we need to make sure that point of inflection corresponds with that turning point. Okay, so that's where you get the third mark from. Excellent. And part D, draw a sine diagram of the second derivative. Okay, so if we think of the function, what is the second derivative but an indication of where it's concave up, where it's concave down? We already know the roots. The roots are C and D. That's what we've labelled here. The second derivative is going to equal zero at C and at D. And we can see concave up until we get to C. Concave down between C and D, and then concave up after D. Okay, when it's concave up, second derivative positive, when it's concave down, second derivative negative. What we've got here. Alright, so last one. And like the way we move through these questions, I think they get progressively easier. Okay, so this is going to be even easier than, um, than that one. Alright, so I'll clear some space here. or anything like that, so that's all fine. Okay. So then, a bit more flipping around to do. Part B, I find the second derivative. Okay, so here's the function, here's the first derivative. When I differentiate that again, I'm going to get 24x squared. So we go second derivative equals 24 Square. Part 2. Determine whether the graph has any points of inflection. Justify your answer. 
using mathematical reasoning. Looking at the graph, any points of inflection? No, no points of inflection, okay? So let's get a mark for saying no points of inflection. So what's that, B part two? No points of inflection. Uh, let's explain why, okay? Because we, people often, they get the, the essential part of the second derivative, but they often miss the later part. So with the second derivative, we have to draw the sine diagram of it. Okay, and we can get this in two ways, like we can just think about it, it's a quadratic, the root is zero, it's opening upwards. Okay, we could graph that function and observe this. Okay, that's how we can get the sine diagram. But let's um, just flip to our notes quickly on page 40. Okay, on page 40, this is an important table because it really solidifies all of the relationships between function, first derivative, and second derivative. I'm talking explicitly about the point f dash dash of x equals zero. So what's that fourth one down? This corresponds with a point of inflection. Again, okay, that's what we sort of all take, easy peasy. But there's a clause, there's a caveat. It says, provided the sine diagram changes sine. All right? So we, we would look at this and say, hey, there's a point of inflection. No, there's not. It's not happening here. Well, it's because the sine diagram does not change sine. So that's our mathematical justification. As sine of f dash dash of x does not change, therefore no point of inflection. Excellent. Okay. Cool. So I'll stop there. I'll float around, see how everyone's going with everything. Let's get into some solid revision.